G'day everyone and welcome to Life in the Peloton presented by Rafa. Got a great episode for you this week. Household name in the female Peloton, Peter Mullins. She's known simply as mum by her teammates. She's been a national champion on road, track, mountain bike and cyclocross. All bike disciplines. Well, excluding BMX I guess. That's one thing left, Peter. We didn't discuss that. She's a well-represented figure in the Australian cycling scene and she's been pro on the road and represented Australia in multiple disciplines in the World Championships and the Commonwealth Games. Peter is without doubt a natural athlete. She began her sporting career by going on 20 plus kilometre runs with her dad after school in the afternoon. She dabbled in a little bit of mountain running as well. She's done everything. She's a great personality and a really great person to chat to. I went up to her place in Bendigo, not too far away from where I'm living in Victoria, and we sat down and just had a good old-fashioned yarn. It was really great to talk to her about that, her career, but also her exciting team that she's riding on, Rock Salt Live, who is also sponsored by Rafa. And I found that really interesting, that the ethos of this team, and we really get into this in the podcast, it's a really different team. And what do I mean by that? They've just collaborated different personalities into this team. Very talented riders, very talented girls on and off the bike. And that's what I really love about this team. But what I really love is that Rafa identified this. They're like, this team is something that we want to be a part of, and that's what they've got. And they've decided to back that team. Just getting to know Rafa this last year as we work towards launching in 2022, I have loved working with Rafa as a brand. I love that they share the same values as Rock Salt do. Uh, They're all about community, inclusion, equality. I love that they have a presence in local communities through the clubhouses and just how they build a sense of culture through the RCC memberships, uh, through initiatives like the Rafa 500. And they just bring a sense of passion, fun and obviously style to our simple world of bikes of course they've got some outrageous kit it looks awesome we chat about her whole career we chat about what's been happening in the australian scene this summer with rock salt live and their success at both the national championships and at the tour down under well the festival of cycling plus what the future looks like for that team but more interestingly we chat all about peter's career she's had a very up and down topsy-turvy sort of career and her confidence in her own ability to step away from the sport when she hasn't been enjoying it and then come back and just find the love for it in a new discipline and become national champion that of course anyway sit back and enjoy this one it's a fantastic episode We're sitting here up in Bendigo, and what I thought would be good to talk about Bendigo, because Bendigo is a real cycling mecca in Australia, in my opinion anyway. There's a lot of good riders that have come out of here, but it's just like this great environment that creates cycling, like a good cycling culture. You don't have to be professional, you don't have to go on to be professional, but even if you're not, there's great track racing here. It's a great sort of hub for cycling. It's a comfortable place for cyclists, but it's also a great place to live, I can imagine. I'm sitting up here with Peter Mullins. She now lives in Bendigo, Spring Valley more specifically. I'll give you the exact number and street name in a minute, (laughs) but she probably won't be here much longer. Welcome Peter Mullins to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Mitch. The reason why I brought up Bendigo is because I think this place is special to you. You're not from Bendigo, you're from Sale, well, Taralgon, right on the other side of Victoria, another great place, but a long way away from here. I want you to tell me a little bit about Bendigo and what that means to you and how you actually ended up here in Bendigo. Uh, So I suppose I've been here for 13 years now, uh, courtesy of my partner, Jared Maroney, but I was actually... I was quite young when I first came to Bendigo I was being coached by Scott McGorry and he had asked me to come up to do a Madison with another young guy um, who I think he was trying to set me up with I'm not certain I sort of dated that guy for two weeks jumped ship to Jared and then I haven't left yeah thank you Scott (laughs) well tell me about the Madison because I heard about this Madison and what actually happened there Scott was saying to me that yeah, I got her up here, he was coaching you. I've got, I got to get up here at this club medicine, you know, throw her in there. This will be a great idea. Next thing you know, he looks across the track and he sees you go down. Crash, that is. And he's just like, oh, no. 
this couldn't have been a worse idea, you know, like, oh, this is my idea to come up. Next thing he looks back across the track and you're like, just dusting yourself up, back in, back into the Madison. Well, I had never done a Madison before, actually. It was quite daunting. It was a club Madison, so they, they tend to pair a stronger rider up with a weaker rider. I was the weaker rider because there was no other women, so all in with the men. And I had run up the ass of Tim Decker, of all people, uh, during a change um, yeah, bounced, got back on, kept racing. I actually didn't hear a bell or a whistle or anything during the race. I was just riding around so blinded. It was possibly the most overwhelming thing I've ever done. I can barely even watch Madison's, let alone race them, full respect. And the thing is, that's what I loved about this story and I'm hoping you bring it up is because it's actually your character, I feel, is that I've spoken to a few people trying to do a bit of research. I've known you for a lot of years, but we haven't had much to cross paths over all these years. We sort of started about the same time and went in and out of the track program and on the road, but we're just sort of just a bit apart. But what I saw from afar was this mentality of this, just like getting it done mentality. And that's what I loved about that story was like, cool, all right, I'm up here doing a Madison. Potentially could have gone the other way. Could have just been like, what the hell am I doing up here? You know, walk off the track, throw your bike over the fence, Scott. Bugger it, but it's just like, no, nah, I'm up here, I'm racing. And that's what I really loved about it. In that beginning there, did you feel like, okay, great, I'm up here in Bendigo, Scott McGrory, this has got a good feeling up here? I actually think um, it's just the way that they used to breed bike mm. riders. I came through the VIS with the Hilton Clark and Dave Sanders of the world and the motor pacing. And I think we were just hardier back then. And there wasn't a huge um, representation of women. So it wasn't that. Uh, the women did this and, and the men did this. We just did what the boys did mm. every single day. If we went motor pacing, we chopped off turn for turn. We didn't get to sit on the back of the bike on our own or anything like that. So I think through my junior years especially, I was really hardy because of that environment that I'd grown up in. Uh, and then, yeah, when I came to Bendigo, I found a, a real community here. The clubs do a really good job of the junior development. Uh, I think the terrain here actually is what makes the cycling community uh, so vibrant. We don't have mountains. Uh, we don't have uh, tr a lot of traffic. We don't have traffic lights. Uh, it's sort of just rolling hills all the time. And that's really conducive to a bunch riding environment. Mm. Um, so I actually, I, was lis I listen to your podcast all the time and I hear you guys say, oh, you know, if we go out with six people, that's a big bunch. And we go out in bunches of 50. Like you don't even have to do a turn. So I wonder if maybe when I was super hardy and then when I came to Bendigo because I don't have to do a turn in a bunch anymore, I'm less hardy. But I do love the community feel that Bendigo has uh, and the fact that we go riding in a bunch where there's a 16-year-old girl, um, a 50-year-old man and then, you know, people like Darren Lapthorn mm. um, all able to ride together. Uh, that's what makes Bendigo a really special place for bike riders. You've mentioned some good local legends there. Tim Decker now, you know, the head coach of Australian Cycling, but local legend. Darren Lapthorn good friend of mine, Australian champion, champion. So there's a lot of good local legends up here and you're also one of the local legends now. Um, tell me about like coming from Sale or Taralgon, from what I understand that your family, you come from a big family, five kids, twin sister, I didn't know that. So you've kept that one under wraps all these years. Um, and from what I understand, you can tell me a bit more about this story. You, your family sort of shifted up to Taralgon to help you be a bit closer to Melbourne um, so you could pursue that dream like you said with the VIS and and um, Hilton Clark that distance now is huge you know like tell me a little bit about the family side of things and that decision to move up here okay we talk about the the culture and the great sort of hub here for cycling but then there's that distance from the family how has that been yeah it's okay I suppose I probably don't really talk to my you know, brothers and sisters as much as most people, but that doesn't mean that when we see each other, we're not, you know, loud and glorious. Mm. And it's like we, we saw each other every single day. And I suppose we're at the point now where they have their own families. I've got something like 16 nieces and nephews. I can barely remember all the damn names of so many of them. Uh, but we were just at that point in cycling. My parents had supported me every single day. And, and I was at the point where I was then able to move into institutes um, you know, the Australian Institute of Sport, the Victorian Institute of Sport and have that as my support neck as, as opposed to my parents. Um, so in terms of them driving me to races and stuff, that wasn't as necessary. Uh, obviously, I still need them for that emotional level of support and check in all the time. And yeah, I, I, I think the more I ride, the more distant they feel from my cycling career. Uh, mm. But they're so involved in my nieces and nephews now that um, I think I'm a bit of a bore. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's like a little side note. Yeah, yeah. How's, how's it going? Yeah, you're good. Yeah, it's still doing your thing. Great. That's one less person we have to worry about. Great. No, that's that's interesting because, you know, like we said, it was, it's a nice sort of environment. But I'm just trying to set up your character here because what I want to talk about is a few things is that you've had a really um, different career. And I heard you say in another thing I was listening about, you know, I'm not overly confident or, you know, I don't boast about what I do, but I really do think you are quite confident in what some of the decisions you've made. You actually had a, I guess, almost two breaks, but really one proper break where you went, that's it, I'm done, you know. Um, and I think that's what I really love and about you is that I guess I've gone through it myself and I've really made that decision now and I know it's over. But that confidence to just go, this is not right for me in the VIS, and AIS, sorry, step away and go away from the sport before we get to there sorry i'm sort of getting <laughs> too many muddled up. but <laughs> i want to go back and talk about the very beginning right back to the start um and i want you to talk about your mountain running your national title there um you are 11 time national champion still 11 you haven't stuck one in there uh, 13 13 yeah. god i missed two over. Well, what to be fair, one's a vet's title, and I was the only one in it. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna add that one. <laughs> everyone missed that one, <laughs> except for everyone in the race. <laughs> no, on the start line, they go, uh, "Good luck to everyone, and well done, Peter. You have won today because <laughs> you're the only one." <laughs> Naughty! You shouldn't have even gone. <laughs> no, no, I was uh, I was coaching a couple of girls in the race and <laughs> helping them win. Well, you've got like a national title over at so many disciplines: road, track, mountain bike, and cross. But before that, was the national title in the the mountain running uh under 18s you're about a 14 year old and tell me about the the very beginning about the story for you getting into cycling through a bit of a backwards way um from the beginning there you through the running yeah so um i suppose when there's five kids it's not a cheap um you know, to put kids through any type of sport, whether it be soccer or basketball or whatever, is it's not cheap when you've got five kids. So we just ran. That's all we did. We just ran every single day. Wednesday after school, I would run 20 kilometers with my dad. Just loved it. Running in the bush, um, getting lost. I suppose I've always enjoyed the challenge of sport versus um, the success of it, really. Uh, and sometimes along the way, those lines get a little bit blurred. But when I was young, it was literally all just about running. I... Um, used to do a bit of track. I fell off a steeplechase, rolled my ankle. Um, a guy I'd been running with, Paul Craig, actually. Craigie, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He said to me, um, stop wasting your time with this running, mountain running business. There's no career in it. You should uh, you should take up bike riding. Uh, so I started doing a little bit of aquathon and triathlon. Uh, then eventually that just phased into full-time bike riding. Track. And like to go back to Paul Craig, he was an amazing runner. Amazing. Stair runner. Did you ever get into stair running? Uh, no, no, thank God. At 14, they, I wasn't into that. I, I, I loved the mountain running. I loved running down the hill as much as I loved running up the hill. So it made sense that in my later days, I would kind of fall in love with mountain biking. But I th- I think I just loved the adventure of it all. Mm. Like stair running, I can see the tower from the bottom. That probably just didn't, it's didn't super excite me too. as much. Yeah. Super hard. I, I, I remember seeing Paul Craig too and think, stair running, that's the key. That is <laughs> the key because he, he was so good as a rider. He won a stage in two down under. And unfortunately, had a bad accident over in New Zealand and now is a paraplegic. Um, but when I looked at Paul Craig, we're drifting off the line here again, but I was like, stair running, that's the key. You know, I was going to university in Melbourne. I'm like, how can I get the bang for my buck? Well, it's probably 12 minutes worth of running. Did you give it a crack? And I just do it <laughs> at my lunch breaks, go into like buildings. You'd have to pretend like you were supposed to be in that building. Like, oh, yes, I'm supposed to be in here. And you'd sneak <laughs> down the fire exit, bolt up the stairs. But... Yeah, I was on my hands and knees at the end, literally on my hands and knees. To be fair, like Annika Langford, uh, world mountain bike champion, she loves a good stair run. You can just, the harder you go, the harder it is. It just (laughs) builds on you. It's horrible. But anyway, um, onto the track, it's just such a difference there. And I guess in that point there, you were sort of getting caught up in what we were speaking about before is like this whole really fine art of cycling. Um, and it's sort of like a full circle what you came. You went into that really fine art, trying to make the junior worlds, um, attention to detail. Like you said, you were you staying at Hilton Clark's house, training with the VIS and all motivated for that. At that moment there, was it like, yeah, this is really something for me? Or what was the feeling there after, like you said, because mountain running was, and as you were a young kid, it was all about adventure, exploring. 
running as hard as you can. Track, beautiful, but very different. Yeah, then I was riding around in circles and doing ergos. Mm. I, um, I think at a young age, I was always heavily persuaded by wanting to impress my peers, yeah. um, whether that be my school teachers, whether that be my coaches. And so when I had the opportunity to join the VIS, um, I was heavily persuaded to impress the coaches and, and track was obviously the pathway back then. And I enjoyed my time as a track rider. I loved it through juniors. Um, there wasn't, I, I think, you know, the whole track is back thing. Back then, everybody raced track. Mm. Nowadays, um, we're so professionally, like, you know, like you say, it's all those fine tuning things. Um, road riders are road riders and track riders are like a fully focus on that. And I think for that phase, I was, I was okay with it through juniors. Um, but then I found the world of road riding. Mm. So I think as a junior, there's not a lot of junior tours. So track was kind of like the pinnacle um and i yeah eventually found road and that was my preference and and also when i actually left juniors um as a track rider we didn't even have the team's pursuit Mm. like the omnium that hadn't been created yet no like i was going up against women like katie mcteer and kate bates to try and make a world squad like absolutely no chance they were world champions at the time uh, there wasn't that opportunity to keep pursuing track. There wasn't, you know, sort of that next step was like out of juniors, you already had to be as good as the senior world champion. Yeah. How are you going to get in? Yeah. yeah, we didn't have podium potential back then. And there was literally like three or four people in the track squad. And then that was it. Um, but what they did have back then, which they don't have now, is that supportive environment for a second squad in Europe for the women. Um, so it's like the tables have just come full circle. Now we have a better pathway for the track, but absolutely no pathway on the road. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, w- I was again grateful that I had that opportunity, keen to impress my coaches. I uh, went to Europe, spent some time with Waza. I mean, my coaches throughout my career have been phenomenal. Warren, some of, Warren McDonald. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Some of the people who I've um, been able to be influenced by, I'm not surprised that I feel the need to give back to cycling so much mm. because that's the inspiration I got from all the coaches that I've spent my lifetime learning from. What was that like, firstly, moving up to Melbourne, living in you know a really great coach and a pinnacle of the sport, Hilton Clark, living with him, but then also after that, going away, living overseas um, in Italy. As a, young, as a young girl, as a young person, what were those two experiences like? What was it sort of shaping you up for this lifestyle you are now? Yeah, I think you had to be so independent back then. Mm. Like we didn't have mobile phones. No. Like Instagram, that wasn't a thing. No. <laughs> it was like a phone card and you'd type in the digits to try and call home to mum once a week. Um, so it forced you to grow up really quickly. Mm. And I think that's why the environment was so uh, amazing at the same time. Um, I spent two years with the AIS overseas and came home and uh, Warren was actually removed from the program. And that was a really, I found that really hard because when you don't have that supportive environment over there in a way, when you're really young, like he was like a father figure to me. So when- Why so? Like, and you say removed, tell me about why he was so good over there. What, what were the things that he was doing? Like, creating that culture how was he able to do that yeah i i mean to me it was just like a family i was over there with with carly taylor and tiffany cromwell the whole squad was young and then we'd race races like the giro and and bring in the sarah carrigans of the world Mm. there was just something about him that i just connected with uh i can't even i can't even pinpoint Mm. exactly what it was but then we came back we had martin barras take over the program and although I admired what he was doing, it took the fun out of it for me. Mm. That's probably what it was really with Waza. He was just fun. We'd go on these epic motor pace sessions to these amazing cafes and and I suppose I lost that sense of adventure uh, when Martin took the program over. Uh, and we were on a camp in Melbourne and I just decided I didn't want to do it anymore. Mm. And it was a really hard decision because I felt again influenced by the people who had supported me to get to that point i was like well i owe it to them i owe Mm. it to my parents i owe it to my sponsors i should keep going uh but i literally got to breaking point i was waking up every morning crying Mm. and i was still performing well like i got that's when i won the under 23 national road tile i was sixth overall at the championships 
uh, had a podium over in New Zealand at the um, racing over there. And, and I thought if I'm, if I'm racing well and winning bike races and still crying every day, something's really wrong. Mm. And so I just said, no, that's it. And um, yeah, stepped away from the sport for a little while. That exact moment, who are the people that to help you come to that decision? Like, or maybe you came to it yourself. You know, it's a really mature decision because not most of us, but I can imagine a lot of people, like you said, you work so much to get to that final position and you're like, I'm not quite there yet. There's just one more step to go professional, you know. It's just like, I oh, just push through it. Come on, I'm here. Mm-hmm. And it's like, to just go, I'm out. I think there's so many people below you that you think, oh, what they would give to have this opportunity. Like, don't be stupid. Like, this is amazing. And my parents actually weren't completely supportive. Mm. Like, they were like, if you throw this away, like, you might not get it again. You've worked so hard. Again, really hard again to make that decision. Yeah. Um, But Donna Razolinsky was Mm -hmm. actually one of the people I spoke to um, in depth about it all. And she was really supportive. And I suppose I appreciated in that time that there wasn't many women who had done it. Mm. Not many women had been down that path and raced overseas and knew how difficult it was to be away from your family and that at home. Um, and then I actually got a life coach. Mm. Yeah, so um, Scott McGorry's um, wife at the time, Donna, uh, I just did some sessions with her and, yeah, we... I mean, for a while there, I thought, oh, she's going to coach me back into it and I'll, I'll be excited again to race. And I wasn't. Mm. Yeah, but it went, it went the other direction. And we decided that, um, oh, well, I suppose she helped me recognize that uh, I wasn't finding enough joy in it anymore and I only did it for joy. Mm. So when that was lost, when that fire was gone, I needed something else. She helped you, it sounds like she helped you ex- help you remember exactly why you got in it, mm. which can get lost over the time because it's exactly what you said there. You're trying to impress this person. You're trying to do something, at the end of the day, not for yourself. Mm. You're like, well, what did I do this for? Yeah, what I was think, the original reason? Yeah, and then and I think when you are successful, that's the easiest time mm. to lose sight of why you did it. If you're like making up numbers every day and having fun, well, if you don't know what the taste of winning is and you lose it, you just you don't recognize it. Well, one of your closest friends, Chris Hamilton, um, he's from Bendigo too, and you guys grew up together. Well, not grew up, but did a lot of training together. Great, like I said, this great network here in Bendigo. Another guy, Mark O'Brien also, he says that one of your best assets is that um, the consistency in personality. You know, that when you guys were here before you went overseas, right to now, you're just that exact same person. And I think that's what's sort of shining through here is that when you came back, you're a bit of turmoil and you said, you know, with, with Jared here, you jumped on the mountain bike. And you sort of found your way again. You found the love for it. But what I understand too, in this love and this sort of, it might sound everyone out there, this cruisy mentality, go for a ride. You do love racing. You oh, do yeah. want to race. Yeah, I'm a real racer at heart. I only train to race. Like I enjoy riding my bike. I don't enjoy training. And I'm one of the few people who think there's a difference between the two. Yeah. Um, I, if I... If I could never race again, then I enjoy that sense of adventure on the mountain bike and I enjoy the social scene of road riding. But yeah, I, I literally live to race. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, when you think about that, you I have heard you say that, you know, maybe it should be like, I, I want to go overseas. I want to just have a go at the classics. You know, this is that eluding sort of goal there. Is that drive still there or is it still just enough for you now, this position you've got with the team with the races you get with the team is that is there any of that sort of long longing you know that goal like ah there's still something I still want to achieve in racing overseas I think I'm in a real transitional phase and I hope that that longing is still there Mm. but I don't feel it on the surface at the moment I put a lot of emotional and physical energy into the team And sometimes it's hard for me to know if that is why I don't feel that fire anymore or whether the fire is just burnt out. Mm. I know that the girls in the team definitely still feel that fire, but I, I don't, I certainly don't line up the way that I did when I was 20. Like I don't have that viciousness about me anymore. And, and I suppose maybe I'm at the point where I feel like I've achieved everything that I'm physically capable of. 
I don't think I'm ever going to win a world title or, you know, go to a world championship again or anything like that. And so maybe I feel content that I have achieved what I will in my life. And maybe I'm looking either for either to be a support network for other people who are wanting to achieve those things or still looking for that sense of adventure because the racing has changed overseas since mm. I used to do it. And I think Strata Bianca looks cool. <laughs> but then I don't have that fire to go there and be successful at it. I have the I, I I want to experience it, but then it is a world to a level race. So you can only experience it if you've still got a fire to achieve it. So I suppose it's a it's counterintuitive for me at the moment. Do you think you had that foresight though? You know, because a lot of people have this. And I've had it myself over the years. It's like ah, oh, you know, if I just committed more there or you know we just to speak speak about that that you had the uh, maturity to sort of see where you're at in that the, the lowest point but there's that point where you look back on your career and go well if i'd just done that or if i just pushed more in this area and suffered it out there i could have achieved this do you think though that your ability to understand where you're at and that confidence to step away from it give yourself a breath of fresh air you know like these goals these these elusive classics goals. I know the person you have to become to do that. And I just hear you speaking. I'm like, that's just not you, you know? So I always say that um, I'm an 80 percenter. Hmm. Would 100% make me happier? Yeah. And and I think it depends on, on where your happiness comes from. For some people, it comes from success in a bike race. Yeah. And for other people, it, it comes from the fun and adventure in the environment. Um. And so I, I see in our team even that we have girls who they're, you know, they're excited about winning full stop. That's completely it. And I, and I think I have been through phases where that has been all that matters to me, but I don't think that phase ever lasts more than like a month or two. Mm. So I'm a complete 80 percenter and I um, am not ashamed to, to say it and to chase things that, that just bring me joy. Yeah. The things that bring you joy on the bike – and that transition of from when you came back on the mountain bike, that pursuit to go to the Olympics as a mountain biker, gravel, cyclocross, that sort of transition there and that finding the joy back in cycling through competition. Um, tell me a little bit about how it was going for that Commonwealth Games mountain bike, but just that progression and that upwards sort of transition towards that, you know, and... Also how Rochelle Gilmore in that sort of phase there for you sort of allowed you to sort of see this different side of it, the when to focus and and find your love and things to focus on. So I suppose I feel like my life's like a dot to dot. So I won the National Road Championships in 2015 and I was attempting at that time mm. to be a full-time mountain biker to go to the Olympics. Um, I got the jersey in January I did not race a single road race in my national champions jersey because I think by that point in my career, I was like, well, no, I won't let you sway me. I won't let you um, say that, oh, well, you won a road race. You should be a road professional because I was like, well, no, I, I, want, to, I want to race my mountain bike. Um, so went overseas and did two World Cups, um, 20, 25th, sort of um Beck can you was just maybe 15 can you just get starts in world cups like that yeah 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 as long as uh well if you're on a uci team you can start or you need your national federation okay. to a previous start so when i ever did a couple of world cups which i'd done the year before as well um and after two world cups i was actually traveling with trekkie at the time mm. and we were both like this is it he just, so we just decided we're going to train through this World Cup in France. And the day after... Why? Because it was just boring or it was just like... Well, we just didn't... We were just getting our head kicked yeah, in. Yeah, right. Like, and so we were in, at this World Cup in France and Jared looked up flights to America. And he said, you know what? Let's just go to America. So we literally the day after this World Cup, and we were supposed to go to another World Cup the week after, we flew to America um, and raced a couple of criteriums. Mm. Uh, raced the Oklahoma Pro-Am Classic, um, then raced Tulsa Tough, uh, and we loved it. Mm. So we were due to fly back to Europe to race uh, the Cross Country Marathon World Championships, and we checked in at the airport, put our bikes on the convoy, and then we looked at each other, 
and we just grabbed our bikes back off. We went and hired a car. <laughs> we drove to Chicago and we just stayed for another three weeks racing crits. We didn't even go to Worlds. <laughs> <laughs> I won the Tour of Dairyland. I remember the first day actually at the Tour of Dairylands because Jared didn't have a road bike because we were obviously going overseas for mountain bike. I had Malcolm Nago, courtesy of Wiggle Honda. Um, and the first day with like three laps to go, um, they called a preem. A preem is like an intermediate sprint where you win some cash. And this preem was worth two and a half thousand US dollars. So I got me money. We went and bought Jared a road bike. And then, yeah, we just <laughs> stayed for a couple of weeks racing crits and we absolutely loved it. And so during this period too, you, you were in touch with uh, Rochelle as well. And you reached out to her and just said, hey, look, I want to go to the Worlds or, you know, whatever. How did she, how did this all come about? What was Rochelle's influence in this? She was so supportive. I mean, I had done uh, many domestic seasons with Rochelle uh, where she had injected fun into the summer of cycling for me. Uh, and then, yeah, when I won nationals, she came to me um, and said, I'll give you $50,000 to sign for our team. I won as an individual in tram kit. And uh, she said, you've got 24 hours in typical <laughs> Rochelle fashion. And uh, I said to her, look, actually I don't want to do any road racing this year wow and she said I don't care I will support your endeavors I went to Europe she gave me somewhere to live she gave me a car she gave me 50 grand and I just pursued mountain biking and she was completely supportive of it which I mean when I look back on is phenomenal Mm. phenomenal oh yeah and she by far is the biggest inspiration um behind rock salt for me Mm. um someone who makes racing fun um tries to market their team um in addition to res- in, in addition to getting race results uh yeah and just make it something that can be you know longevity in the sport what i've understood is that you're a really you're the heart of that team in terms of not only physically but what you can do for the other girls there but also what you do for the management of the team which is also incredible tell me a little bit about the ethos of rock salt firstly about this team before I get into what your role is there. Uh, so Rock Salt is essentially one amazing man out of Sydney called Calvin Rundle and his partner Jojo and now their dog Tui. It was all a family game. Um, and he wanted to just change the face of women's cycling in Australia, I suppose. He is a guy who was frustrated with the system and the lack of opportunities for female bike riders, especially internationally. Mm. Uh, so he just put his money where his mouth is for 10 years now. Um, to be able to give girls an opportunity and a platform to go professional. Uh, he's never had ambition to run a world tour team and, you know, be involved at that level necessarily. Uh, but we have a UCI registration so that we can race overseas, give the girls mm. a taste of whether it be America or Europe, um, dip their toe in the water, so to say, and then decide if a professional bike riding career is, is what they want to do. And we've had riders like... Uh, Sarah Gigante come through, Neve Bradbury. Um, we've got Nicole Frayne at the moment. Mm. I assume at some point we'll lose her to a World Tour team after a national title. Uh, and so that's where we get that satisfaction. It's from being able to give girls an opportunity to do something they wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And I feel good that I can contribute to that, not necessarily financially, uh, but through their development on the bike. Well, tell me about the girls that are in there. Like you just mentioned their names, but it's a bit of a, an eclectic sort of mix. Um, and the actual sort of, you know, ethos of the team is, you know, they've picked their own line with the team being run as a collective and shows that it is possible to balance life with cycling, with work, with study and family. I really love that line. I've just taken that straight off the website because I was just sort of doing a bit of research myself about the team. And what I drew to myself was this direct correlation with the team that I started with way back in the day, Drapak. Drapak cycling and that was a real very similar sort of ethos and and push is that look we want to go professional that's a really nice goal but at the end of it we want to make these well-rounded human beings that if the professional line doesn't happen we can come out as a normal person and that might sound funny for someone listening but you can definitely relate to this because I I think you had this sort of passion as well that when you're younger and you're trying to go to junior worlds, you're trying to get into the Victorian Institute of Sport or you're trying to race professionally, whatever it is, it's all in. You don't care and it has to have this mentality weirdly. But you need that advice from other people around you like yourself who's a bit older to sort of go, look, you can make it as well. If you want it enough, 
you can make it as well with this passion as long as you're still doing these other things around it it takes a different type of personality i think that's what you guys are trying to create there just reading between the lines yeah i think for me so i was part of the australian institute of sport straight out of juniors part of the road program and amazing opportunities to race overseas had a great time with the girls um but after a couple of years I wasn't enjoying the racing as much as I was the time off the bike. And it was clear to me that I loved riding my bike more than I loved trying to be the best in the world. Mm. And so I had to find a balance where I didn't lose that love for bike riding. And I, and I, I pushed too far and I actually left the Australian Institute of Sport and quit bike riding for like three weeks because I'm weak as piss Hmm. and then I and that's when I found mountain biking I found mountain biking and I was with Jared at the time and one of his friends had loaned me a ten thousand dollar mountain bike straight to the top and I went to this um mountain bike race down in Woodend actually Hmm. uh he went to a road race um tour of southern grampians don't know if you remember that one Yeah, (laughs) yeah yeah um and I said well I can't go to that road race I just quit bike riding three weeks ago like how embarrassing and he's like go to this mountain bike race so I went to this mountain bike race with his 60 year old dad uh, and we rode with like 20 of us for the whole day and I had more fun on a bike than I had had in years and I thought this is what I want to do I'm going to get a job and I'm just going to find a way to ride my bikes on the weekends I'm going to get up early and that was more enjoyable to me than being a professional athlete Mm. and so then when the opportunity came around with Kelvin to build on what he already had with Rock Salt, which was a summer program for professional bike riders, it was an area and a space where people who didn't necessarily want to always go that next step could still balance their life and just enjoy the fruits of cycling, whether that be racing in America, whether that just be racing NRS, or maybe it's just a couple of summer crits. Mm. Um, but just a platform where we could get together, have a great time, and not lose our love for bike riding. When you stepped away, there's got to be some ego attached to it to be a pro, I think, um, or to pursue this sort of dream. It's it is about you. You need, you know. There's like the thing that I love about you is that I'm sure there's ego, but there's not as much as what I think, you know, because it's like oh, I want to be over there doing the Tour of Flanders. I want to be doing, you know the women's Giro, whatever it is, you know, like whatever race, you know, is up there in your eyes. But from what I just heard then was like, I want to do the race in the Wombat Forest in Wood End because it feels awesome to ride my bike. No one knows where that is except for me because that's my forest out there. (laughs) It's just like, that's what I love about your story. And that's what I feeling is, the feeling is that as you learned over your career, was like, I'm going to just follow what makes me happy and not what I think I should be doing or what everyone else thinks I should be doing. Yeah, and I, I think um, I've said all throughout my career, when I was younger and, and I went to junior track worlds and mm. road worlds and you know I was on the podium there, I, th- I think back then I had the confidence that I was talented enough to be um, competitive in an international peloton. And then as the years went by and especially like – in the last couple of years, the depth of women's cycling has grown so much. I'm pretty open in saying that I phys- I don't have the physical capability to be competitive um, in a world to a peloton the way that I would like to be competitive. Mm. I really like to win bike races and I can't win something like the Tour of Flanders. I don't, I don't sit here and we talk about ego and I have confidence in ego at a certain level, but not at that level. Like I fangirl over those competitive... Like I... Yeah, like racing even this week with the Grace Browns and the Loretta Hansons of the Peloton, I don't put myself in that same class. Um, so I suppose for me it was, it was quite an easy decision, but I wanted to step back a level where I could enjoy bike racing, be a part of the bike race, um, and I just wasn't getting my head kicked in every single week like I would in Europe. Uh, so I think some people look at it and say, oh, it's kind of sandbagging mm. to do a lesser level of bike race. But it by no means am I taking away from the girls who are better bike riders. I just don't enjoy losing every single day. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's talk about the team for a minute then. Just the two down under this week, you had three finishes in the top 10. Nicole Frayne second, 
Tillyfield 7th, and you were there 10th. So, you know, you talk about this, you know, I'm going to get my head kicked in. You're still top 10 there. Um, the team started the year with a real bang. Um, Australian champion, Nicole Frayne. But also before that, the big announcement was we're taking it up a level. You know, the Australian... O- Australian only women's continental team. So like you said, it was like, okay, we've got this beautiful ethos and you're making it work in such a way, but now suddenly they went up a level, got the continental license and sort of started with a bang. How are the girls feeling now in the team? It's just really, like you said, it's that balance. How's your role in the team balancing this, I guess this expectation now of, okay, we're up this level, you know, and maybe this was your idea, you know, let's, let's go up, let's bring it up. But then also keeping that, funness around because from what i see just looking on the outside it is fun you know like we said it's an eclectic sort of group of girls you don't mind sort of doing a road trip over there stopping at mickey d's grabbing a burger you know like keeping it real like how's that balance been and what's your being your role in that apart from being the management stuff yeah so i think the next step for everybody is always the step forward and you know you you think okay uci continental Uh, more racing overseas, maybe a full racing overseas after that world tour. Uh, But for us, I think sometimes a step sidewards is always just as important. Uh, For us, that was the addition this year of our multidiscipline squad, uh, of signing some girls who I know have strong engines on the mountain bike, who have a passion for riding and a passion for racing and introducing them to the world of road cycling. Mm. Um, that to me in itself is really exciting and the girls have just taken it by the horns. Um, but that obviously also then incorporates um, our sponsors, um, you know, Liv, Shram, Rafa launching their trail edition this year. Uh, I think those relationships that we have uh, are with brands who enjoy the fun behind riding bikes. Mm. So I think we we continue to take those little steps forward, but maybe they're more a step to the side, something outside the box that people wouldn't necessarily think to do. I don't think it makes us less professional. I just think that we're maybe opening new doors that people didn't see before. And I think other people are inspired by what we're doing. Well, clearly not less professional. Like when you look at those results, like what more could you have really hoped out of? Teams classification as well, the two are down under, you know, three in the top 10. What more would you really expect on a more professional team? Yeah, I think our results... um, Supposedly, sorry. No one can see see me doing inverted commas. More professional team, supposedly. Yeah. I think um, results on a piece of paper, I always say to the girls, you win or you lose. Mm. To me, second is still a loss. Like I try to teach them um, to strive for more every time they hit the start line. But at the same time... I want them to dance on the start line. Like, I just want them to remember that um, YOLO. Mm. Like, I've been doing this a really long time. A lot of the girls... Explain YOLO, (laughs) because I actually didn't know what that was like a year ago. I'm like, I Googled it. (laughs) I did. I didn't even know what FOMO was. And I was like, why are you sending me this? What does this even mean? So YOLO is you only live once. Yeah, right. Probably everyone knows that. Sorry. I think there's a lot of women who come into the sport like super late. Like, I started when I was 17 been I've done 16 national championships at Bunningong mm. and I've got three girls in my team this year who raced it for the first time and they're nearing their late 20s mm. so I'm trying to cut corners for them essentially um, and say yes you haven't had that extra 10 years of experience I'm going to try and teach it to you all in a week um, but I really want you to enjoy that entire process because it's such a privilege that we have to be able to race bikes around the world. Hmm. Um, yeah, and we want to enjoy it together. Tell me about the Nationals then. What was your role there? You won the National Championships with Nicole Frayne. What was your role on the day out on the road with the girls? Like, how do you go about, is it like a, you know, loosely road captain? You know, what does that actually involve? Yeah, I try to be the road captain for as long as I can, yeah. knowing that at one point I will get dropped. But I mean, Road Nationals for us started in February last year. We made a decision to, um, you know, cut some girls from the squad to be able to bring some new girls into the squad. Um, We really had a goal to build a team that could win the national title. Uh, We obviously knew we already had Emily Herfoss in the squad. He's been on the podium a couple of times. Justine Barrow's on the podium, uh, myself, and and we really bolstered that with Nicole Frain. And we talk about confidence. She's someone who comes into the team knowing that she can win bike races. 
And I think the biggest thing for her is she didn't have the team behind her to do that. So I feel proud that we helped someone recognize their potential and ability um, purely just from the system of our team. Mm. And what about your race craft? Because sometimes I feel like when you've been twice national champion yourself, under 23 and senior, um, I wouldn't say it doesn't suit you, but arguably it's it's a tough course. You know, it's uphill, downhill. Um, I think your race craft is one of your best attributes, you know, and, and it could also be arguably the worst thing too because sometimes knowing how to race so well sometimes allows you not to put in the extra hard work outside and I mean that you know in a good way I'm not saying I you're not training all the time. <laughs> but you know what I mean like from what I understand too it's like you know you can get yourself out of trouble by racing really well mm. how you've been able to pass that on to the girls and you know you know the course so well um what are you able to pass into the into the girls with that sort of knowledge on such a course yeah well, I think I would have done 200 laps mm. of that bunny young climb all painfully and I always say to them man like if I had your engine yeah. the races I would win <laughs> but I the biggest thing is instilling confidence in them I think patience on that course is a really big thing I see a lot of talented girls race panicked mm. um, and so for Nicole this year the way that we calmed her was having good riders around her who could do the hard yards before she had to you know, play the final card. Um, but I, I think Bunning Young is actually a pretty straightforward circuit a lot of the time. Each year it varies. This year especially because of COVID, we didn't have all the World Tour riders come home. So to be fair, I actually would have been disappointed if we didn't win this year mm. because I knew on paper that we had the strength and the numbers to win the bike race. But also maybe strength in team too, in yeah. terms of the, the commitment to the team. Sometimes you have those teams. I've been in the, the first year we went there with um, Green Edge. I think we had 16 guys. <laughs> we had too many, yeah. you know what I mean? But a smaller unit, a small, more um, committed unit was, was the key there. Yeah, and I think the girls are all really in touch with their strengths as bike riders. Mm. And I certainly don't shy away from telling them what they're really good at versus what they're average at. Mm. Um and for new girls in the team, they, I mean, they hadn't raced together before. And they picked it up really well. And I mean, I'm super, like, we have fun, but I'm super hard. Like, before the race, I said to them, if I can see you chase your teammate, I will take your bike off you at the finish line. <laughs> it's as straightforward as that. And, um, yeah, so we, ha we have fun, but at the same time, I, when we go to race day, we, we have a professional race plan. Um, the girls each have their role and they are really expected to do it. I, I suppose because I feel like uh, my strength is as a tactician, uh, I need to be harder on them in that area than their physical component because their physical component is whatever they work on pre-race day. The only mm. thing that we can improve on during the race is how we race it. How do you go with that dynamic of being sort of the, I guess, on-road sort of director or someone calling the shots or even putting that sort of angle on it you know if you do this this is going to happen but then suddenly you've got to also connect with them in a personal sort of friendship side how's that dynamic i don't know how it works um they call <laughs> me they call me mum like in the team i'm just mum um i suppose with, they know with girls I, older than you too yeah, yeah 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 i suppose um i think there is just a really huge level of respect i think they've seen me race bikes they've raced against me for a long period of time and when i say things to them um they know it's in their best interests and that they will improve as a bike rider if they listen to it. Uh, but I really enjoy the role of trying, like for me, helping them win a bike race is bigger. Mm. Um, and in the years past, I suppose we've, we've had a race plan and if that doesn't play out, I just try and save the day with a sprint finish. So I feel like my role is like pretty simple. It's probably the high pressure one, but it gives them an opportunity to play out a bike race where they don't have to worry about me or, or lead me out. I want them to race as if they're racing to win and bunch sprint is always the last alternative. We, we never um, we never front the start line saying, okay, mum's going to win today. <laughs> <laughs> Who was someone that you looked up to to sort of, as you came through the ranks, someone that you sort of looked up to to learn this sort of stuff off um, over the years? You know, maybe you raced with them, maybe you didn't race with them. Yeah, yeah, like early days, um, we had a, a lot of girls in the VIS. We had Katie McTeer, uh, Jenny McPherson. I suppose I was like Emma Mackey, 
all through my junior years, I had not girls who were even just a little bit older than me, like mm. way, way older than me. I'm talking 20 years of experience. Uh, so I think that was a huge part. And then uh, Rochelle Gilmore, mm. when I was with Beagle Honda, uh, she pretty much taught me everything I know about leading out. And then that kind of phased into me trying to be a sprinter. Uh, and then my partner, Jared Maroney, mm. has watched every single race I've ever been a part of and is a really savvy sprinter himself. So, and because he's my partner, he can be really hard on me and I'll be accepting of that. So it's not ever going to break the relationship. What is your exact position in Rock Salt, aside from a rider? Uh, so we have three directors of Rock Salt because we're a non-for-profit. Um, Kelvin Rundle, Justine Barrow and myself. Um, yeah, and then I, I don't run the socials anymore, thank God. I've given that one across to Tilly. Uh, I just deal with all the sponsors. Um, Kelvin and I work out the race calendar. Uh, I probably would say I um, pick the team, but I never pick a new rider without addressing the rest of the team. I think that dynamic and culture is the most important part of a team, especially with women, (laughs) (laughs) Um, that we enjoy being in each other's company and and riding bikes together and that our strengths and weaknesses complement each other in a race. How's it go picking the roster? Like how you... How do you, you? Is there an interview process, or is it word of mouth, or you know all the girls trying trying to get on the team? Or yeah, we actually have never signed a girl who's approached us. Mm. Which um, don't let that deter people from approaching <laughs> us. Uh, I suppose the last two years has been really unique because we've been chasing off roaders who would never have dreamed of applying for a UCI Continental Road Team squad. Um, so that's been really hard. Is that we only. We only have 12 spots. We have an ex-terror racer, a downhill racer, um, junior cross-country champion, uh, marathon riders, obviously our road riders. So it's been really hard because I would love to give the opportunity to more people. Mm. I'd love to have 50 girls on the squad. And we have great um, support from our sponsors in terms of the equipment that the girls are provided with. And, and I wish that we could make it a bigger setup. Um, so picking just 12 is, is really cruel. And then obviously every now and then we have to lose a few to sign a few more. That's probably the hardest part. Mm. And is the idea to sort of push the girls on to bigger and better things or just whatever comes of it? A mix of both. So every year we try to sign someone who really wants to be world tour, mm. um, someone who wants Europe. But then we also have some staples in the team like Emily Herfoss and myself who whose current ambitions don't go beyond, you know, racing at the level we do uh she's obviously got a kid now so coming back from that yeah i think we support endeavors for certain bike riders in the team who hold the core structure and then the other girls we want to develop them and move them on what are some things that you do in the team not necessarily rules but things that you try and um, implement for the one the riders coming in are there any sort of necessities that they have outside of the sport of cycling or what are some things that you try and do throughout the year that maybe other teams don't do or things that you've learned gone, you know what, if I am ever in charge of a team or whatever, like you said with Rochelle, things that you learn from her and go, this is what I want to do with my team. I think spending time together is a really important one and for our squad because we're across different disciplines, it's not necessarily an easy thing. So this year having team camp in Bendigo was great. Um, We have a Snapchat chat, we have an Instagram chat, we have a Messenger chat, we have a Slack chat. Um, keeping that social interaction within the girls so that they always feel really close Mm. regardless of what we're doing with race days. Uh, I think we are really flexible with race calendar. Um, The only race that is compulsory for the year is the Australian Championships. Uh, And apart from that, the riders get to pick and choose their own program. Mm. We really wanted to focus this year on riders who wanted to go to Europe. So we actually lost a few girls who didn't necessarily have that passion because we wanted to be able to build a squad that was strong enough and willing enough to really invest in themselves for a block like that. Road racing. Road racing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. What about the alternate stuff? Alternate. Um, you know, is it people just go, you know what, let's, let's do this race. You know, the girls put their hand up and say, hey, how about we attack this race? Or is it a group sort of decision? I feel like I'm the dreamer in the team and they're just like, that sounds like a really cool dream. Let's do that. Uh, like we want to go to Thailand this year. Uh, but even just like a lot of the girls in the team had never ridden off-road. Like Emily Herfoss had never touched a cyclocross bike and she went and did some cyclocross races last year. Um, Izzy Flint was the same. She won some national series races. 
Um, and vice versa, we had our youngest rider, Ruby Dobson, tackle the Australian Road Championships last weekend as a first year under 19. She got sixth. Mm. She'd never done a road race before. So I think I, somehow the riders and the team inspire each other to do something that they might fail at. And I really love that about the team. People who are used to winning at a certain level in a certain discipline, being vulnerable enough to go and try something else because they feel like they're in a supportive enough environment to do that. Mm, That's awesome. Tell me a little bit about now where you are going to go as Peter Mullins because you have really had your finger in a lot of pies over your career. You know, like we said, you want to go all the way back to the mountain running, moving away from home, all the cycling stuff. But all throughout that, you've also worked the whole time, which is something that a lot of cyclists don't do or professional sportsmen do, but has also added another beautiful layer to your who you are as a person. You've sort of got that real life ex- experience. Then there's the other side of it. Um, I'm, from what I understand, you're working in a meat factory, working in the bike shop with Jared. That's a, that's a local bike shop here in Bendigo that's you know survived when bike shops died out and now it's pumping again plus you flip houses which means you know a term that i haven't really that used to is which means buying um rundown houses and fixing them up yourself you know i was like oh who who does the work we're sitting in this beautiful place here i'm like oh you just designed oh, i can get someone in to do that like no we literally do everything ourselves so there's a lot going on what plus rock salt which we've spoken about what is the future looking like you know the the immediate future um, and I guess the long term you know do you think about sort of 10 15 years in ahead or are you just a bit more in the now uh, I think I always live for the now thinking of the future always scares me a little bit because I I can't imagine my life without bikes and I know at some point there will be no bikes in it mm. or at least not at this level and that sort of scares me actually um, Jared and I don't plan to have children. So the team for me is very much those girls feel like my children. So I feel really responsible and it, it in a way maybe fills that void. Um, I actually, without trying to be coy, don't know what my immediate or long-term future is. I think I'm trying to find my home at the moment in terms of whether I'm ready to... Um, completely move into a support role in the team, um, retire from the sport or um, say, hey, one last crack, let's go next level. Mm. And I think the reason that my I'm a little bit anxious about it all is that for two years we haven't raced bikes. COVID has just put such a halt on everything. Mm. And I think when you go through something like that, um, I shouldn't say devastation for COVID, but I've been through other phases in my life where – um, you know, you have those tough times. You either come out the other side and you okay, okay, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go hard, or I'm just gonna succumb to it all. Mm. So I feel like I'm at a point where I'm either gonna go, okay, boom, watch out, bitches, I'm winning bike races, <laughs> <laughs> or um, I'll be watching you win bike races. <laughs> what about women's cycling in Australia? Do you think this is a really positive step? What the team um, Rock Salt's doing, and sort of like, I guess the. Uh, immediate sort of future for female cycling in Australia. Um, I just see like the the Santos Festival of Cycling. I've actually missed all the men's racing, but I, I watched all the women's <laughs> racing. It was it was great. You know, it was I loved watching it. There was some great attacking, and I just think it's in a really good spot, and it's growing. Yeah, I think the depth in the peloton is in a really great spot. And again, I think COVID has stunted the development of where women's cycling would be today if it wasn't for the last two years. Um, I still think there's a long way to go. Like I'm hearing rumours that at one of the races next year, they don't want to put up prize money. Mm. You know, and I hear things like that and I get really sad, but then, you know, you flash back to Santos where they paid equal prize money. So I think there's some good and some bad within the sport within Australia. I, I think the women's peloton are still propping themselves up. I mean, all the riders still work. The teams are still run by boyfriends a lot of the time. Um, The professionalism is difficult because there's just not the supply demand within our country like there is overseas. But I see the growth in Europe and I'm just so hopeful that, you know, we can have a system like that in Australia. But, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to be part of that system in the future in terms of I think it'll be a long way down the track. But I do think the pathway to Europe 
um, isn't as difficult as it used to be. I think girls are more confident to make that leap um, into lesser teams, especially um, just because they've got other competitors who have done it and got their own war stories and whatnot. Thanks very much for coming on the pod today. Thank you. Well, what did you think of that episode? What did you think of Peter? She's got a fantastic character, personality, tough as nails, but very, very likable. And you can see why that nickname, Mum, sort of suits her. Even though she's not the oldest in the team, she's the most experienced but she loves to give that experience to her teammate, as you can see from the success they're having already at the start of this season. I really did love sitting back and talking to her. And of course, next week, I've got a talking luft with Peter as well. Following that, I've got an exciting guest in two weeks' time in Life on the Peloton, Andre Lagersh. He's a cardiologist specializing in cardiac imaging. You might be wondering what the hell that even is. He's a consultant cardiologist at the St. Vincent Hospital in Melbourne, Alfred Hospital in Melbourne and the Baker Institute Specialized Clinics. He's tested my heart for about the last 10 years of my 13 year career as a pro. If you don't know already, I'll go into this a little bit more in two weeks time, but in the UCI, you have to have echocardiograms and health checks every year to make sure you're, you know, fit and healthy to race the world tour. Well, Andre's the guy I went to throughout my career who conducted those tests on me. He's a special interest in cardiac imaging exercise physiology, sports medicine, and pulmonary circulation. The really interesting thing with Andre is, after completing his Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery, he then went away and completed a PhD and four years postdoctoral research on the effects on endurance exercise on the heart at the University of Melbourne and then went across to Belgium at the University of Leuven. Really, really interesting stuff. We're gonna dabble into what is happening with the athletes, What happens to an athlete as they train for so many years? What happens to their heart? But more interestingly for me, what happens afterwards? Anyway, that's in two weeks' time. Make sure you hang in for that. Next week, I've got Peter Mullins on Talking Luft. As always, a massive thanks to our proud sponsor, Rafa, who are putting this podcast forward this year. Since retiring, I've actually loved going back through my old kits and being able to wear some of my old kits again. More recently, the last three years in the Rafa kits. I love going back, and I don't know if you remember, a few years ago, we did the Stealth Blackout Kit for EF. That was the first time we wore Rafa Kit, and I was one of the lucky guys to be able to wear that Blackout Kit at the National Championships. I've been rocking around in that. It's been awesome to have that, and I've enjoyed sort of dabbling in some different kit, non-pro kit, the last few months. I'm still waiting for my EF 2022 kit to arrive. I can't wait to see that in person, but you can hear it in my voice. I'm just excited about kit. And that's what I love about working with Rafa on this podcast too. A big thanks to Lara behind the scenes and of course, Will Jones, who puts all these episodes together for us. Guys, until next week, thanks a lot for listening. The music in this episode was composed by Pete Shelley. Cheers, mate.